So welcome, I'm so glad to be here today. Um, one, American Atheist is, uh, I think is for us, um, is one of the little slightly more younger, hipper, more active organizations, and so that makes me really excited to be here. And I think that a lot of the local chapters have some fantastic things that are going on in your local communities, and so that makes us very happy. So I'm glad to be here. Just a little bit of what we're going over today. One, I want to talk about the mindset of the upcoming generation so that we have a good understanding about what sort of took place in their lives that are forming their mindset, um, about the changing world on the college campus and what's sort of happening there, a little bit about how local organizations and local people can work with the Secular Student Alliance um, in their local communities, uh, how to engage the next generation, so not only with the Secular Student Alliance, but new people, younger people, um, and just new people in general. I think all of it works, and sort of things that what you can do in your own communities and working with other people. And then I typically do answer, question and answer. And we have a table over in the exhibit area, so if follow up on those sort of things, please come and talk to me or stop me in the, the, the convention as it's going on. I'm more than happy to talk about you, to you. And I'll talk about you as well <laughs> when you leave. Um, but anyway, Secular Student Alliance. So we are the only national or de uh, organization dedicated to working with atheist, humanist, and non-theist students across the United States. So we also look at, we are working with the future leaders in the secular movement and the future leaders who are gonna have secular values in their communities. So right now we have about 300 chapters, uh, mostly in colleges and universities, but also in high schools and we have our first middle school. So we, uh, I know, right? So we also know that about one in four in the US identify as non-religious. But for students, that's one in three. So we're, we're moving in the right direction here. I have to show this, this is Bailey. So she started a, uh, our first SSA in a middle school in Utah. Yeah. And just like me, just to make you feel a little less in, uh, adequate, she's, uh, she just turned 13 like last month. She's on her third book. Yeah. Phenom yeah, F future leader, phenomenal. Um, so, I want to talk, that's a little introduction to the next generation, but I want to talk about the next generation and what's up and coming for the secular movement, because I get to work with students every single day, they're passionate about what they do. So, we're talking about the, you know, right now, the class of 2022, I always have to think about that when I say that, but Deloitte uh, College always does an assessment. What are the major things that have happened in students' lives that give us an idea of how they're going to be living it out? So, I want to share some of those with you today, it gives us a little insight into them. So for the students today, their parents told them about their memories of what happened at 9-11. Since they've been born, the US has always been at war. Donald Trump, with of course broad shoulders, right? Um, has always been a political figure, first as a Democrat, then as an independent, now as a Republican. Vladimir Putin has always been in charge of Russia. Bill has always been Hillary's aging husband. They have no idea. <laughs> Enron didn't exist. Chernobyl has never produced any nuclear energy. Uh, cloning has always been a typical laboratory procedure. Autism has always been linked erroneously to vaccines. The abortion pill has always been available. Sandy Hook was their Columbine. And this is the first generation that knows at any time that they can be shot in their school. So we just celebrated, uh, well, unfortunately not celebrated, I think recognizing uh, Colin, the history of Columbine, and uh, earlier this week was the anniversary of the Virginia Tech shooting as well. So these students have always been able to get their cafe lattes at Starbucks in the Forbidden City in China. So many of us probably remember when we needed some information, we used to have to go to Encyclopedia Britannica, not anymore. They simply go on the internet, They've always had Survivor. Uh, snowboarding has always been an Olympic sport. Ketchup has always come in green. They will argue endlessly about what the first episode of Star Wars was with their parents. They've probably never heard that dial tone or you have mail. They have lived in a floppy-less world. So, and, but, however, They've been go able to go on any time and you know, check on the nanny cam to see who was babysitting, use their fingerprint as their ID, 
Uh, eHarmony has always been using its algorithms to connect people. And they really don't care about email anymore. So it's about texting and instant communication and live video. So when we talk about the millennials, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the millennials, uh, but we have the baby boomers, and then we have the millennial generation. So generation X, Y, and Z. And what I, you know, end of the alphabet, no more generations after this. Um, but what I'm going to I'm mainly focus on is, is Generation Z, because those are the students who are in school now, college, university, and those sorts of things. But when we look a little bit about the millennials, what's important about them? They're the largest generation yet, 80 million in the U.S., 2.5 billion in the world, and they are the most uh, ethnically and racially diverse generation that we have. They grew up on social media, and this is predominant in their lives. And by 2020, they're 50% of the workplace. By 2030, they are, they are 75% of the workplace. So they inspire to make a difference. They're confident, and they are achievement-oriented. They're also technoholics. So typically living on five different screens at one time, it's integrated into their lives. They're you know, always on a screen. That's the way they find out information. And, um, but they also the, the one thing about this generation is they understand this is temp it, uh, information on social media should be temporary and private. They've seen the mistakes of many a politician who have put stuff out there. Um, and so they, they're, they're, some of their dominant worlds are, are you know, things that don't last and, and they do like privacy on social media. But it's also real-time connection. So they can be in live chat, live video chat with anyone anywhere in the world. And they're using that to be super, super creative and to collaborate with multiple people not only in their own local school or their local town, but anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world. So it's an exciting time for them, just what technology, the information that that offers to them and what's available to them. But what we're looking at is we're really looking at, you know, who are those students who we work with? And so the non-religious, um, and for us, it's really sort of the atheist and the humanist and the, the non-theist. So again, we know that one in four in the United States, religiously unaffiliated, one in three of students, and for us, it's about 19 or 20 percent that identify in that sort of that atheist, agnostic, humanistic realm that for us, we really work with and are the heart of who we work with as, as a, on a daily basis. So and that makes up the Secular Student Alliance. We did a little survey and found out some information. So we want to know how some of our students identify. So while many have identify as multiple categories, the clearest yet is still atheist. And that's a lot of where they are developmentally. Um, but it's, it's, that's a good place for us to be, and we know that is. The other thing we looked at is we want to know, okay, you're an atheist now, where did you come from? So we looked, what was the, what was the you know, the religion in your school? Are we just making more atheists, or, you know, are we just taking atheists that have atheist homes, or are we convert, you know, doing some deconversion? And the clear reality there is most of the students that we work with came from a Christian household. So the little other down at the bottom there, that's almost all Mormon, so... We're stealing from them, too. <clears throat> so they say the two things don't never talk about, in, you know, religion and politics. We're getting on both. So uh, an interesting thing about 56% of, of atheists identify as liberal. And we know that young people today are less identifying with labels. So they're less likely to call themselves an atheist. They're less likely to abide by those sort of things. For so the LGBT community, they're less likely to call themselves gay. They're less likely to call themselves lesbian. We know that that's happening. But when we look at their behaviors and what they believe in, it's sort of clear. Almost 75% think that the government should aid poor. Almost 90% think that abortion should be legal. Over 90% have no issue with homosexuality, and almost 80% thinks that the government should be protecting our environment. So the one I love is 83% think that right and wrong depends on the situation. It's not a higher being telling you what's going on. You have to make that up for yourselves, and it's based on your values, and it's based on looking at all the evidence and making an informed, intelligent decision. So it's sort of clear, these students are pretty liberal. So <laughs> um, we also know a little bit about politics. 20 years ago, one out of 10 Democrats used to be religiously unaffiliated. It's one in three now. So this is clearly moving in the direction. For Republicans in the House, it's about 15%. So they're coming along. We also asked our students what their political identity was. And you can see, once we get, limit their choices, they identify as you know, very much on the liberal basis. So what's happening on college campuses? 
So we know that college campuses are home to many, many faith-based organizations and ministries. Um, and you know, oftentimes there may be like 120 faith-based ministries on campus and one secular student alliance. So we know those numbers are disproportionate to what's going on in our, in our world and what's happening with our students. Um, so we're trying to do as much as we can to, to work against that. As I said, the numbers are in our favor. And the religious community is sort of figuring it out. And we're, well, this is, you know, the conservative Christian ministries. Twelve of the largest ministries got together and went, something's up here. And they realized that 70% of Christian college students ended up leaving their religion the first year they were on campus. We're pretty proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not sure exactly what their definition of leaving their religion. It could be they stopped going to services. It could be they stopped going to the meetings. You know, there's probably a big definition of what that is. Um, their response, however, is you've got to give them a lot of credit. So they came together, dumped millions of dollars, um, and created Campus Link. And so it is an online program that identifies high school students when, before they leave school and knows where they're going to college and already sends them information on this is the, your community and this is your church and these are the organizations and forms that, all, that link. They're talking about building community before they even go. It's great. You have to admire, you know, appreciate the system and what they're willing to do. But their goal is to rejuvenate God's presence on campus. So, and their goal is to, to double the number of religious students, and they even, you can go on campus, you have to log into Campus Link, it's an online sort of thing, and you can even download resources on how to convert, reconvert atheists back to religion and how to share the word of God with them. So they are not taking this line down. They are, and they're dumping, the Campus Link alone was millions and millions of dollars. So I was, you know, for the, there's the top four campus ministries on, you know, Hillel, Navigators, uh, Newman, and Campus Crusade for Christ. Anyone have an idea of what their an, to combine their annual budget is? Just, how much? Five billion. You're you you're the, the highest one I've ever heard. It's actually one billion dollars with a B. Billion dollars. So that's what we are. They are. And this, you know, I think Hillel is the only one that actually files their taxes. The others, people went and sort of looked at, at annual reports and those are things. But a billion dollars, that's what we're up against. So, and that's why when they think, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot into Project Blitz. I know you've got Allison and Nick and Jeff and Debbie who keep you completely up to date. And, you know, Allison is on top of this. So, but yeah, Project Blitz and what it's doing on, you know, their secret plan to sort of take, make, it, make the U.S. A, a Christian theocracy. But it's also all of those in God we trust bills, or in God we trust posters going in schools, and the Bible literacy and everything like that, which clearly affects our students. So they are highly organized, actively prioritizing, and extremely well-funded. So yeah, but that brings me to our students. So this is a picture from our conference, our summer conference. We have a, a, a conference mostly dedicated towards students uh, and, and their sort of student leadership and their organizations and those sort of things. And our students, I just want to give you a little, you know, what we know about them. One, our, our, our membership and our student leaders are about the same demographically. So they're about 50% male, 50% female. We like that. So about 40% of our, our student leaders and, and student membership identify as people of color. We like where we're going. So about 20% of our student, pop, student population, student members, identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And another 5% identifies as trans and gender nonconforming. So when, you th when we look at this group or your local groups, they're looking at pretty different than what we currently see. We have to be ready for this, or they will go elsewhere, and we don't want that to happen. But I want to share some of the things that they're interested in. Clearly, separation of church and state, major issue for them. Also, the environment and climate change, clear pro-science issues, racial justice, very important to them, LGBT rights, so uh, women's reproductive health, and making sure that their campuses are safe places. Immigration, important to them, and supporting the dreamers. The, you know, and then safety on campus. This was actually our, our march, the march in Washington after um, 
the shootings in Florida, at the Florida school. And we went there with the posters. We had not only multiple student chapters go, but we teamed up with atheist humanist uh, groups as well. And we, we want policy and change. I don't know if you can see at the bottom there, but it says secular values and action. So our groups walked around with these, and then we just handed them out. We had a 1,000 of them. So for, hopefully for the first time, there were a lot of Americans that had to sit and think about what that meant, secular values and action. And we want to continue to promote that, and our students were excellent advocates in, in doing that. They're also out there doing voter registration and getting students to vote, and they're doing community service. This is a fun picture. We just took our first secular spring break. We took a group of students to um, Puerto Rico to rebuild after the, uh, the hurricane there, um, and they were phenomenal. If you want, I could, I'll sit here and cry and tell you stories. Oh my God, it was absolutely amazing. Be so proud of them. <clears throat> They're fantastic. Uh, but anyway, I was, are you ready? That's what our students, that's what this upcoming generation is all about. And we want you to be ready for them. We want you to make meaningful connections. We want this to, to, to continue and for them to be in, involved um, in this community. We often, often get the question, we want younger people involved. And it's a le little less likely with, with American atheist local groups. But we often, what we hear is, well, we don't want our group to die out. And that's not the right reason. Like, that's not a great marketing campaign. Our organization is going to die if you don't join. <laughs> so we have to be providing things with experiences they want. We have to be dealing with topics that they're interested in. And these are all secular issues and separation of church and state issues. So I'm going to talk quickly sort of about, one, the Secular Student Alliance, about sort of friends and family, and about youth outreach and just outreach in general. So the Secular Student Alliance, uh, so we really look at, we are a partner in the secular community. We have a great relationship with Camp Quest uh, and the, things, the work that they're doing with summer, with summer camps. Many of our students come up through Camp Quest and, be, and join and start Secular Student Alliances. And then our student leaders actually go back and volunteer. You can also volunteer at Camp Quest during the summer for a week. It's amazing. Um, but we are also a player in the larger secular community. We look at our students, we want to be a pipeline and going out and making sure that our students are getting involved in these other secular organizations. So what we see is, what we've traditionally seen is they start out with us and they graduate and they sort of disappear. And then for 30 years, then they come back in. We want, we don't want that to happen. We know that they're getting involved with other things. We know they're doing fantastic things, you know, in other organizations. But we have like Madison, who's interning here at American Atheist. Well, you know, the former SCA staff was almost all SSA alumni. So the interns at CFI every year, SSA students. So we are, there's a lot that we're doing in this community, but we want to strengthen that. So what we're talking about is building relationships. For those in local, local communities, how are you building relationships with the younger generations and with students? So one of the things we look at, when you're doing that outreach, who's the most appropriate person to do this? And I, I do this you know, as coming from the LGBT community. We had the people who, in our history, and we appreciate our history, who had to fight. Who, and the same thing with the atheist community, who had a fight to be that atheist, who had a, be that fight to be that gay man. And it was a fight, and it was hostile. And some people still hold on to that, where our students aren't there anymore. We're appreciative, I almost said, thank God they're not there anymore. We're appreciative they're not there anymore. Um, that, that society is, it has moved on, and we're there in a much more open place, and they can do different things and bring the movement a little bit further. But oftentimes, the people with the fights scare the students away. They need to respect and understand the history. But oftentimes, there's, when you're thinking about your groups, there's probably like a, a couple good people to really reach out to students and younger people and new people. And that, that organizations need to sort of take that stance and sort of figure that out, have that conversation. So for the SSA, we started in 2000, and we've been growing and growing ever since. We're almost over 300, well, over, just over 300 uh, chapters, mo again, mostly in college universities and across the country. We have two more states left before we get all 50 states. We're working on it. Um, so in outreaching to SSAs, so what, what we want to do is, what we often hear is from people like, we want to get more involved, we want them more involved, we want them more involved, we want them more involved. We keep asking them to come to our events. What we have to do is turn that around. They're not gonna. This, I'm, they're not gonna. They don't know you. They don't trust you. They have no clue who you are. You are these strange people. 
So what we have to do is we want, you need to go and support them. So we want you to, you know, like, so, and we can help you make these connections. If you're in your local community and you don't know that student leader, call us. We will help you make that connection. But the thing that go in is asking them what you can do to help. They may not have an answer the first time because not many people have asked that question for them. So you may have to ask a couple times, but go to them, support them, let them know, you know, ask, ask if you can attend their meeting. It's their meeting. It's their event. Ask, let them give you permission to come in. When you go, listen, like observe, find out what's happening, go support them. Allow the students to be in charge. All of our chapters are student initiative. I do not go to any campus and start a chapter. One, because that's the way too many, and they're just not successful. Students have to be in charge. It's their, it's their organization. Um, if they ask you for a suggestion, give, you know, give one or two. It's not the time to list off everything they did wrong. Be supportive. Um, be positive when you go. This is about building trust, and that's what we want local groups to do. And again, we are here, if you have questions, we are here to help, we'll be on the phone with you, whatever you need. Because what we really want is, we want to grow these relationships and turn them into bigger, you know, bigger things where we're mentoring our upcoming generation. So it's not just we know you, it's we're really doing some mentorships. And if we start to do those sorts of things, the students will get to know you and they'll start participating. Sort of a deeper level and, uh, uh, there, you know, Bart Campolo on, at USC when he was there was sort of infamous for this, helping the students. So he didn't go to the students' meetings. He met with some of the leadership ahead of time and go, okay, how are you gonna lead your meeting? What are you gonna bring up? He helped them do that. He helped them plan their events. And we see this in Florida with a Free Thought Society there, and we see this in Arizona, and we see this in, with, uh, with, with Triangle in North Carolina. We see a lot of groups doing this and having these deep, broader, deeper, deeper relationships with the students, and we love it. We want to encourage this. Attend their events and bring their friends. Great way to help out. Send them a text of encouragement. They like the text. Um, and when you get to know them more, take them out to coffee. Invite them to an event. Um, and then you, we get into deeper things about internship and career advice and those sorts of things. There's a reality, though. None of your groups are, this, are exactly the same, and none of ours are as well. So there is no magic wand where I can tell you exactly what's going to work. It is some trying out, and it is some effort, and it is some, you know, some trial and error and those things. Again, we're here to help with that. But what can local organizations do? And this just doesn't go for students. This goes for younger people, new people as well. So fun and active meetings and events. You see some of the things our students are involved in and what they're, they're passionate about. It's not about going and having a discussion. They've done a lot of that. They're in school. They sit through that all the time. They want to be doing things. They want to be active. They want to have an experience. When you're doing, if you're there at a discussion, like at this, this alone, I will not get to meet most of you or find out much about you in this situation. When you're out there talking about something, when we're, we're out there volunteering with someone, I have a chance to interact with you and find out. I have a chance to share my story and you have a chance to share your story with me. It's those experiences that build those, those broader relationships. And what new people, younger people are looking for is that. So that may not be that everyone in your organization is up for that, that's fine. You know, we may have to, you know, it may be certain people can involve in different things. And again, that's having a, a conversation about that. But volunteering and making a difference, they love. Invite them to have a more active role. One of our students has, let, has been the stage manager of the Free Thought Festival in Sacramento for the last two years. She's going to be doing her third year. Don't mess with her. She's fantastic. Like, she's got these leadership skills. You want that as part of your organization. Some of our students can redo your, your website in a heartbeat. They can take on your social media. We have students in Kansas and in uh, Wisconsin who are planning their own multi-day conferences for free, like this. They got skills. You want these students involved. There's a reason we're putting, uh, investing in them and putting training into them and leadership development into them. They're phenomenal people. So some things that local groups can do Sponsor them, to sponsor a student, a scholarship. We do that. We work with several other organizations and, and facilitating that process for them so it's easy for the local group, but it builds this local network for, the, for local groups. 
And we have several groups that sponsor them to come to our conference. So again, they're getting this leadership training. It's an investment in our future. We know the religious communities are investing. If we don't start investing in our community and in our youth and in our students, they will. So millennials, and I know for, for groups who have been established, you know, this is the generation that's grown up teaching themselves stuff. So they feel a little more independent coming in. They're not stuck in those rigid environments of like, we've been doing this for 50 years. And so they're gonna come in and they're gonna question it. They're not being entitled. And it may be frustrating on your side. And trust me, I work with them every day, I get it. Um, but they're gonna be wondering why, why we can't do something in a different way. If you automatically say no, they're gone. So it's, one, it's sort of working with them and going, okay, what, let's talk about this. Yeah, we've been, doing these, we've been doing these lectures, we meet at the same time every week in the same spot and the same person picks the speakers and those sort of things. Let's mix it up a little bit. You can have different things going on. Uh, and this is the way, again, to get them involved. What we want them to do is join. We want them to stay involved in the second community. We want them to go from SSA chapters to local chapters in their communities. We want them to see that happen. And again, the religious community does some things right and some things not. This is from their own study, and I have to thank Emily Newman. For, if she's with AHA and uh, Ethical Society. We did a joint presentation. I stole these from her. Um, but the, the, uh, the religious community did their own surveys of why teens were leaving, what they liked and what they didn't like. And there's some things for us to learn from, really easy. So, you know, the first arrow is people in church, church are intolerant to different beliefs. And I have a feeling that, you know, we tend to like, let's talk about it. And we t tend to be much more open and about different beliefs. That's an asset of ours. So religion rejects science. Clearly we don't. Again, an asset of ours. The churches are hypocritical. Their actions and their values don't correspond. Let's not fall into that trap. So the church isn't a place where I can express my doubt. And I'm proud that SSA chapters are often a place where, as, where people can ex express their doubt. Um, so let that be a place where the, you can have those conversations as well. Um, and, you know, the church teachings can be rather shallow. And I don't think our conversations are. I think we have deep, meaningful conversations. These are our strengths. We need to be able to market ourselves to young people. So what are your strengths of your organization? And let's use some of the things, these things as well. So what are some things you can do? Welcoming and inclusive talk. And I've got a little slide on this specific about it, so I'm going to go on to the next one. Intergenerational and separate spaces. We want spaces where older people and younger people have a chance to get together. There's a great value that takes place in that. So we also want in the same thing sort of separate spaces. So they're in, in Arizona, they have their own building and while they're having their discussions with the adults, the kids, and these are kids, you know, high school and those, you know, elementary school, they have a game room set up where they can be entertained. They're involved, they're there, they're part of the discussion and conversation. Again, active projects. And then again, thinking about the benefits, what makes your group special? So what else you can do? Getting online, your social media and your website. Clearly, this, this generation, that's where they're finding out their information. And we know, one, you know, most of our students find out information from their campus peers. And then it's something like 25% are finding out about SSA chapters online. And that we've seen that continue to grow and grow and grow. So advanced planning and promotion, and this means that you're providing information about transportation and parking and childcare. If you want younger people who have families, they need to know what they're gonna do with their kids and that there's a place for them and if they're welcomed or not. And that it requires a little bit more. A lot, much more of our students don't have cars. So they're relying on different transportation. So they, they're, you know, helping them helps you as well. So, and again, encouraging that participation in leadership and listening to their new ideas. So, welcoming inclusive talk. I, and th th we get a little blunt here. Um, but I, I've heard most of these coming to local chapters. So, one is people come in and go, oh my gosh, how old are you? It's a little off-putting at first. So, you know, it's a great thing. Hey, what did you think of the event today? It's an open-ended question statement. You get to have a conversation about what they like. And then you know what to respond with. Are you new here today? Really tells them that you don't know who they are. <clears throat> so I don't think we've met. My name is, introduce yourself, start that conversation. So do you have kids? 
Many people will take that as a little bit of violation of their privacy because it's because they don't know you. So and again, sort of what brought you here today? Much more open in a conversation. Great way to find out about them. Great way to tell you, uh, opener for you to tell your story. Are you in school? So again, tell me about yourself. They'll, tell, they'll choose to tell you whether they are or not what they're doing. We hear this one all, oh my gosh, new people person walks in the door, we need more young people. Okay, you're scary. <laughs> so it's, it's just great to meet you. Like, new person, welcome them. And we often encourage, at the, you know, at the door or outside, having someone to greet people. Bring them in, introduce, if they're new, introduce them to someone who's been there a while. And again, you know, be smart. Who are you going to introduce them to? And then, oh my gosh, meet our other young person. That just tells them you don't have lots of young people. So in a great way, let me introduce you to my friend. So again, we're talking about community. We're talking about family. This is, for many of our students, SSS are their family. So I'm not going to go into a lot of, on social media. I could go forever on social media. Um, but one thing I would do mention, I know lots of groups love Meetup. It is clearly a favorite of local secular groups. Uh, uh, SCA just sponsored a uh, leadership of all Southern California, and we had leadership from all the different local groups. Uh, I think it was like 60 people in the room. And we had some of our student chapters was there, and they brought up Meetup, and one of our students went, what's Meetup? It's not where they are. It, it's not a resource that they are typically using. If they run into, I'm not saying get rid of it, because I know that's how lots of people find out about it. But for young people, it's not their thing. So we look at using platforms that can show you're active. There's a way to, to you know, converse. There's a way to have discussions. There's a way to show pictures of you having fun and doing stuff. And that's really when you were looking at you know, sort of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So just sort of really quickly. Facebook, if you only do one, Facebook's the one to do. And I know they say that young people are leaving, leaving Facebook. And while there's some, when, and I can show you slides, and we do promoted advertising about how the 13 to 17 age group is our largest group by far on Facebook. So they're still there. So it's a way to show that you're interacting. It's a way to show that what you're doing. And it's, you can show that sort of stuff. You can, you know, that's what young people want to see. And there's, if your, your social media, you know, about 70% of that stuff should be like stuff that you find interesting. And only 30% of that should be like what your organization is doing. Like we've got a meeting coming up. We've got an event coming up. So again, action oriented. You can steal from the national organizations if you're local. You don't have to come up with it all by yourself. So Instagram, um, it's where the young kids are right now, um, primarily of, the, you know, the, of those three. Um, so it's, sometimes it's a little harder for people to use. You can actually advertise on Facebook and automatically have it to go to Instagram. So if you're not Instagram savvy, that's what I recommend you do. That's what we do. Um, so, and again, it's all about themes and photos and those sorts of things. And again, you can do this directly through Facebook as well. The other, of course, is Twitter. Some of you like to have your Twitter batters. I've seen them. Um, it's a great place to have really short arguments um, and one-liners. Um, but for your political stuff, this is the way to do it. Um, you know, it's a way to find out, a, you know, easy sort of things. And the great thing to be able to do is, you know, if you're looking for what young, you know, hopefully young people are looking for, share our tweets. You, you know, we sort of are curating things that we think younger people are going to be interested in. Um, and also, you know, American Atheist and the other national groups, really easy to share those sorts of things. So... Who's going to outreach to your groups? How are you going to do it? And how are you going to make young people feel welcome? Really, those are sort of conversations for your local groups to have. Um, we are definitely here to help you. Um, one nice little thing. Uh, so I sort of, Nick, uh, I sort of said, hey, I'd love to do a little thing where we can have a little social. Like, can you tell me a time in this schedule when, like, you're not going to be busy and I can say, like, hey, we're having something at the bar. Come down if you're a student or if you're SSA alumni or if you're one of our supporters. And so Nick just, like, he threw it on the schedule. So, and, like, got a room and all sorts. So thank you, Nick. So, um, so thank you to Nick and American Atheist and to Phil Ferguson, who's a dear friend of ours and a great supporter of ours, for sponsoring this. I truly appreciate it. But please, if you're, if you're a student, if you're an SSA alum or one of our supporters, please come talk to me. Let's have a conversation. Let's get to meet each other. And if you have more questions about, about it, you're welcome as well. Um, if you do have questions, I know I've got like three, sec three minutes or two minutes, five minutes. So we can do some questions if you've got them. I'm happy to yell out. Or I, we do have a table at the exhibit hall. Um, so, you know, if you want to do that there, I'm happy to answer those as well.
I don't know if you're the gentleman to answer this or not, but as I hear the speakers and on my own, I think what is a mantra we might incorporate within the atheist community to enlighten and inspire people to move forward? You know, religion's been at it for centuries, so if we could just come up with that, that's just one little example. Yeah, and um, I think there, I think there's lots of slogans that we can look at and sort of promote. Um, so, I, you know, I think, you know, American Atheist has come up with some great ones. You know, atheists are, you know, when uh, uh, quality is at, at under attack, atheists show up and those sort of things. That shows we're action-oriented people. But I really think what's important for us is it's not what we, uh, it's not as much what we say, it's what we're doing. So for younger people, it's about seeing you visible, what you're doing, the impact that you're having. So I'd rather us look for how can we build community how, and be, we're like, oh, atheists aren't joiners. Atheists don't show up. You all are here. You all are at your meetings. I, I Sorry, I don't buy that. So we have to provide this environment where people feel welcome and they feel valued and we can continue moving forward as a community because we still have students who are facing, you know, I'm just being an atheist compared to like, I want to go out there and show my atheist and then live this every single day. So I'd rather, talk, how do we build community? People will, you know, build it and they will come. Um, but, you know, if, if we can build a community, we can show through our actions of that we're, you know, we're not hypocritical, that we're, you know, we're places we can have conversation, those things, I think people will come. So I don't know if there's a particular slogan and all the, uh, all the chapter, all the organizational organizations sort of have their own, but I think if we're showing people what we're doing and we're active in our community and we're showing up as open atheists, that's the best thing that we can do to show young people, one, that there are, there are more people like them, and to show them how to get involved in what, what the options are and that you can live great lives and, you help other people. Hey, um, most of the Facebook uh, groups that I belong to are closed groups. So anything you're posting on there, it's you're just posting to the to the you know to the choir basically. Yeah. So um, what do you recommend for getting that more in the public eye? Thanks. So, so yeah, so with Facebook, we uh, we actually encourage our groups. Um, so to have an open Facebook page and a closed group Facebook page. So you can have more than one. So we, and you know, I think if, you're, if you've ever come to our Facebook or any of our social media, we have open, face, uh, open pages. We also have a closed one that's just for our student leadership, where they can have their own conversations and, sh you know, ask questions and share information, those sorts of things. So I might, you know, have a public one where you, you know, you're, you're, you're out there, you're showing people, and you also have to be careful of showing people who are okay with being out and visible. Um, but then you can still have your private one where it's internal communication and you know, those private things that you wanna keep private. Have both. So, and again, students are great to get involved in that and have them helping lead that for you. One more. Hi. Um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, doing some research about why young people are leaving the church is because they notice when they're being advertised to, mm -hmm. and they are they can pick up on marketing, I think, a little bit better than other generations because it's been around yep. for their whole lives. Um, so my question is, how do we reach out to these uh, younger people uh, in a way that is more authentic? Because I wouldn't want the same thing to you know come back and bite us. Yeah, yeah, their BS factor is way high because they've lived with this. Um, and so, I, but I think you, you in essence, answered your own question. It's be authentic. It's share the stories that you have. It's by what you're doing, sharing that with them. That is genuine. And that is, and they will, they'll either, you know, relate to it or not. And so they'll either seek out more like, hey, that looks fun. I see people having a good time. These people are interested in some of the same things that I am. And again, you're showing that and doing that. It's active sort of involved thing. Um, or they're going to go, hey, this isn't for me, and, you know, then hopefully they'll go to an ethical union, or they'll go to uh, American Humanist, or, they'll, you know, they'll go to CFI, they'll go to someone else. We want to keep them active and involved. But I, I think, you know, again, it, it is, it's being authentic. 
And so, and we do advertising, advertising, um, and we often look at that, you know, we do a couple different ones and we can see by the analytics clearly on the backside what's working, what's not. Um, you'll know by the responses, you know, how many likes you're getting, how many questions you're getting, what's working and what's not, so play with a couple things. And if one, one you're not getting any sort of thing and the other one's like, hey, this one's doing well, do more of the other one. So, and then play in, play in that area and see what's working and what's not. But for us, students like to be active and engaged. We know that. So, in what they're involved in, those sorts of things. So, that's really having a good time, being involved and engaged in your community, making a difference. That's what's going to start attracting people. Come and talk. I'll be at the, we'll be at the exhibit hall, so please come and talk to me. So, thank you very much. Um, and we really appreciate this.